ISO 27001 Annex A 8.4 Access to Source Code. Let's start off with the definition so you know what it is that you're trying to do. Read and write access to source code, development tools, and software libraries should be appropriately managed. Okay, so what we're looking at here, source code. What the standard is doing is taking all of the good work that we've done previously and just making sure that certain things are covered off. Here, this is relevant to source code, and it's only going to be applicable to you if you have source code or software development uh, within your organization. If you don't have that, look at the tutorials that we've done previously on how we handle controls that are not applicable to us. It's not going to be on your statement of applicability and you're going to follow that process. If you have source code and you need to control source code, then there are a couple of things that we need to consider. First of all, we need to consider that source code is just a data type and we've already put in place processes around access control, right? The whole user access lifecycle management is something that we have already covered. And all we're going to do is we're going to adopt that to take account for and reference for source code. So whether that is a slight deviation in the requesting and an approval process, the, the basic principle is that that process is going to be followed. So you have an access control policy who says what? You have an access process and a lifecycle management process. We've looked at technical controls already about access to data. We've already looked at that and covered that. So there isn't anything particularly new in here other than there may be nuance about the process, the minutiae about how you go about allocating roles and responsibilities within software development tools, how you go about access, uh, granting specific access technically uh, to source code. And that may be more appropriate if you're using a development uh, company, you're uh, part working with the development company and partnering with the development company. So these are some technical things to consider, but your policy is already in place. You know what you need to do. Your process is already in place. You know what you need to do. Technically, you know what you need to do. This is about doing your risk assessment of your source code, making sure that access to those development tools is restricted, taking into account things like dev, test and production environments uh, and the sensitivity of that code and making sure that you have implemented that proportionate and appropriate to you. Let's do a little bit of a recap. We're going to have a look at documentation, right? We're going to look at that process. You're going to have done a risk assessment. You're going to implement logging and monitoring, which is a control and a tutorial that we've already covered. What is it that you want to log? What is it you want to monitor? And you're going to look at the potential use of things like dig digital signatures uh, for code verification. And you may even start to look at things like escrow about where code is uh, placed um, in the event of a disaster or you can't get access to it and legal arrangements with your clients uh, so that they can access that code that is held in escrow. But there is nothing new here. I don't want you to be overly worrying about it. What I want you to do is take the controls that we've already gone through, take the policies that we've already got, and I want you to apply them to a situation of having source code. I'm not here to tell you how to do development. What I'm saying is within your development environment, restrict access in line with policy, within line with classification, follow your lifecycle management for user access, implement technical controls proportionate and appropriate to you. You know the tools. Right. You, all you need to be able to do is evidence that you applied the policies uh, and the approaches when it comes time for the audit. When they log in and say, show me the global admin, show me the uh, privileged accounts. You're in a position to say, here is our policy. Here is our process. This is the uh, steps that we took. Here is documented evidence of requesting it, of approving it, of finally revoking it. This is how we allow third parties into our environment or we access their environment to download the code. This is how we make sure that we back up the code. This is how we put the code into escrow if escrow is important to you. These are the digital signature technologies that we use to verify that the code is as intended and hasn't been altered. So apply what we've already done in a technical way to you and you are going to be absolutely golden. Nothing at all to worry about in here. Top three mistakes or top mistakes that people uh, make. Allowing access to everybody uh, to code, right? Big, big mistake. What are we looking at? The confidentiality code is important to you, right? It's your intellectual property. Your competitors are going to be interested in it. People in your organization who might want to spin off uh, businesses that do what you do and take your clients are going to be interested in it. Allowing access to, for everyone to your code is probably a bad idea. So we've done role-based access. Look at the segregation of duty, the application of role-based access, proportionate to you, mitigate and manage that risk. Uh, another mistake that we see is code is on laptops. 
Again, not necessarily an issue, right, that code is on laptops, but we're talking here about single source of truth. If the single source of truth for you is that code is on a laptop, then I want you to give some severe consideration around what that means to you. If one individual only has the most recent or the single source of truth, what happens if they leave? What happens if their device is compromised? All of the scenarios that you can go through that would lead you lead you to wanting a centralized solution of some kind, right? The only reason I raise it as an issue is if it is the case and you want to accept it, put it on your risk register, accept the risk of that being the case, put your compensating controls in that show how you do your protection, how you do your backup, how you do your integrity. But the reason I raise it is the number of times that I am approached by a client who say to me, X individual uh, lead developer has left the organization and they've taken our code with them. I mean, it just happens, right? How can we get it back? How can we engage with them? That's for another day, right? Incident management and incident response. Let's not even get there, right? Let's not even get there. Let's put in the technical controls around the management that supports the policies and we're going to be golden. My name is Stuart Barker. I am the ISO 27001 Ninja. We're working through the technical controls. So until the next tutorial, peace out.